I want to welcome our panel here and uh, thank everybody for showing up. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce everybody myself, uh, and then we're going to have a really exciting conversation, I think, that we prepared. Uh, and the last few minutes will be for, um, for, for, for audience questions, if you have any. I think uh, one of the things I want to say is when I met the panel, uh, what really struck me about this collection of investors is that they are so diverse, and it really reflects the idea that money comes from lots of different kind of places. It has a lot of different motives. And if there are entrepreneurs in the audience, they can start to understand uh, how the investors sort of think. Uh, and, and we're going to try to get into a little bit of psychology today. I'm going to start introducing people. Tom from Aquaspark here. Uh, Aquaspark is one of the largest uh, aquaculture-only focused funds in the world. It's 200 million. 200, it's actually a, a community of over 200 investors globally. And so it's not a conventional venture capital fund. It invests uh, somewhere between one and a half and $2 million on the A round and probably into the B. Um, and they have 512, uh, 520 million euros under man, assets under management. Uh, Karsten Chrome is from Hatch, which is the world's leading and main uh, aquaculture accelerator. And they also have a couple of small venture funds that run that go up to $3 million ticket size. Actually, it's not so small. Uh, Hatch's total assets under management is $110 million uh, with over 50 portfolio investments. So very, very broad experience in quite a few companies, which is why I love accelerators. Um, uh, uh, Marcel Schmitz. Has, you've had like a lifetime in food, but currently he's a director of a family office, so family money, right? Um, and the board director of Entebel, which is an insect protein, team, protein company, uh, and interested in sustainability in, in several other endeavors. Uh, Jitendra here is from Woodside Energy. Uh, Woodside is a top 10 uh, petroleum company globally, and they have a fund of about five or six billion dollars that they intend to use to minimize CO2 emissions around the globe. Uh, corporate investors are actually very, are, are, are not an unusual structure, but this is a really large fund and we're really welcome to have, have you. Uh, and, and our latest addition, Max Holtzman from Ocean 14 Capital is also a very large fund. Uh, they do uh, late stage venture investments and growth investments on the order of $1 million to $20 million. Uh, but uh, Max has had this amazing experience coming in and out of government and working with policy. And the fund is funded partly by governments, including especially Europe. Uh, he was a, 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 an advisor to the Secretary of Agriculture in the Obama administration. So just a very different way of sort of moving policy forward. Uh, really interesting, um, really interesting examples of how money has different motives and moves with different directions. Okay, so let's, let's move on to our question. So the first thing that we all decided to do was to every, have everybody talk about something that they've seen particularly that really jumps out at them as how they like to participate. So just not everything that they see, but something really really something that they're interested in focusing on and representing as an important movement forward uh, as they see aquaculture and blue economy right now. So why don't we, why don't we talk with, uh, start with Karsten. Uh, okay. So um, yeah, this event is around um, replacing fish meal and fish oil in, in feeds. And one thing that I continuously see is that every feed ingredient company at some point gets to a stage where they have to build their first commercial pilot. And that is usually still technologically not a de-risk phase, but it is usually too large a ticket for VCs like us to participate. It is also not the classic VC scalable funding. So we see, person, or personally I see, and my company sees a, a gap here of um, funds available for companies building their first commercial pilot. And um, I think that is, in our portfolio, something that we see time and time again. Um, typically, it's between 10 to 30, 40 million that needs to be raised. Um, typically, companies try to do a combination of uh, grants, uh, soft loans, and some equity. 
but it is not ideal. Um, and I remember last time at this event, there were a couple of funds, one or two, um, that were actually focused right on that type of financing. But um, I haven't heard much um, from them again. Um, and I personally uh, think that we, so right now we are conventional VC fund with seed series A stage investments. But I think our next fund, and this is like two years down the line, will focus on funding uh, ingredient companies that build their first commercial pilot. And it'll be, it'll be a venture debt type of structure. Um, and I, I'd love to have conversations with all of you in this room and with this panel, of course, whether you see the same thing. Uh, I personally think the sector could be much further if that sort of funding structure had been available some time ago. Uh, also because you know, we've seen the uh, um, you know, biomass perspective and it sounds optimistic in the future, but if you looked at that same chart 10 years ago, it was already looking like you know, the next five years we're gonna be you know, replacing fish meal, fish oil, and, and soy massively, and that just didn't happen. Um, the Cargill Sustainability Report, for example, from I think last year showed a 3% alternative in ingredients, if I remember correctly, so very small percentage points, and, and it just hasn't been as great as we all thought it would be ten, 10 years ago, but I think it has the potential, and one of the major reasons it hasn't been that great is that funding, funding gap at that particular stage, in my view, anyway. Yeah, I think that innovation is really great, but if it never reaches the market, if we can't have that scale, you know, a lot of the a lot of those efforts will just die on the vine. So that's an important question. All right. Um, actually, why don't we go to Detendra next because he uh, operates on very large scales. Okay. So I intend to operate on very large scales. We haven't yet started, but. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with oil and gas. Actually, I'm not an oil and gas person. I'm a space cadet, not wrongly put, sorry. I worked for NASA for 21 years and joined oil and gas four years ago. But we have a problem. Our emissions are our problem, and the world can't get rid of oil and gas in two years, five years, 10, 50 years in transition to renewables. While doing that, we want to do sustainably. I'm going to tell you one thing. Woodside is, was a boutique oil and gas company uh, in Australia. Now it's a, it has a worldwide presence after merging with BHP stuff. What I want to tell you is very important here. People don't invest in oil and gas because of anything else than 10 to 15% returns. The same 80% of oil and gas companies are owned by shareholders, period. The same investors actually told Woodside, we put a climate report for the second time, and it got rejected overwhelmingly this time by the same investors. They said, you are not doing enough for your scope three emissions, which are emissions after I sell you the methane, you burn it, and you create CO2, right? And there are fugitive emissions in all these operations. So they have told us, now this $5 billion goes towards reducing scope three, which is emissions you create after burning my gas. Nobody would have thought, and actually, uh, I, I plead patience from Jennifer Holmgren, wait, it's coming, but nobody would have thought Woodside as a company would invest in biotech companies like Lanzatech, String Bio, uh, no one nutrients here, and there are three others I can't talk yet, but we have invested $300 million in renewables and biotech. Uh, one big challenge I see, there is only one company I see which is a overnight wonder over 17 years called Lanzatech. It takes time to scale this up. Uh, there are some great innovative ideas here. They won't transition unless you are cognizant of what are the things that these huge polluters require to do. Uh, my shareholders, on the other hand, also smack me down. If the investment is less than 10% NPR, you can't invest in green. So I got a paradigm that I have to live with, a paradox I'll breathe every day, but we'll get there. That is why we are, in, we are investing in scaling. 
not to the pace I want to, but I'm young, I'm impatient, I have a dream. Sorry, somebody's line I stole. But, uh, but those are the realities. But look, oil and gas companies are compelled now to do alternative pathways in terms of carbon valorization and keep that molecule in transients as a reduced molecule for longer time than just emitting CO2. Great, thank you. Marcel, you wanna bring up your? Uh, yeah, so um, I am an investor in um, Ento Bell. Uh, broader picture I do is sustainability investments in everything that has to do with uh, waste recycling, uh, litter, um, uh, consumer to business recycling, B to business recycling, and I also am playing in uh, insect meal. Um, very nice to hear from the gentleman from Biomar that the insect meal uh, industry has a great uh, future. Um, but it, but uh, it was capped out, actually. Did you see that? I was wondering why. Because it didn't continue to increase. The single cell protein did, but the insect meal was capped out we're, we're after five years. <laughs> we're not in a discussion we'll, we'll, we'll part see. yet. We'll see when that happens. <laughs> uh, so that was very good to hear. Uh, you know, my observation is that the insect meal industry has cost as a main challenge. Customers are not... Uh, able or willing to pass on a premium to end consumers, and therefore we have to compete at price levels that are competitive to fish meal, and that's a challenge. Uh, there are three solutions to that. Uh, one is cost come down further. Uh, Antobel is a cost leader because we're in Vietnam where labor is cheap and capital is cheap, and it's kind of warm. That's good for black soldier flies. Um, the second uh, possibility is that prices go up, among others, either because consumers start asking for more uh, fish free uh, or fish meal free uh, uh, fish, uh, or alternatively, uh, because of regulatory aspects, um, or because of functional benefits that insect meal uh, potentially can provide. A third way is to include the externalities, the economic externalities of fish meal into the price of fish meal. Um, it was mentioned this morning that the carbon footprint of fish meal is very low. That is because fish meal only incorporates the cost of bunker fuel and um, the cost of the processing of the fish. Uh, it doesn't incorporate the, um, the cost of the organic material that is being dragged out of the ocean. That's about, from what I'm hearing, about 13 tons of CO2 per ton of fish meal. If you put that into the cost of fish meal, uh, the insect meal industry has a great future because all of a sudden we're going to be very competitive and everybody is going to be building very, very large plants. So um, if you're out here and you're interested either in waste recycling or methane or any of those subjects, please come and talk to me. If you know something about what we need to do in order to make sure that LCAs incorporate the cost of the organic material, uh, the CO2 impact of organic material being dragged out of the ocean. Please come and talk to me because that was what I would specifically like to get out of this conference. Actually, I was wondering, you mentioned scale. Uh, do you think that how much do you think we'll get if like you can increase the output tenfold or hundredfold? Is how much cost margin is there to, to sort of obtain that? Well, so so Entobel has built a thousand ton plant where it's typically produced, you know, between five, 600 tons a year and sold it in order to get their feet wet in the market. And now they have built a 10,000 ton plant, which we are currently ramping up. Obviously, if you go from a thousand ton to 10,000 ton, the economics start to work better. Um, but that said, um, the industry, even at that scale, and, and if we can get to 10,000 tonnes, we're going to be one of the largest plants in the world. Um, um, even if you get at that scale, we still have work to do, either in selective breeding or in optimization of feed to product conversion. And we know we can do that. Um, we know approximately what the potential is for selective breeding. We know with pretty good indication as to what the potential is from uh, feedstock to product conversion because we can see it on a lab scale. So we are hoping to get another couple of hundred tons out of uh, the cost price of our product. If we can do that, then we will start to make the EBITDA margins that actually will attract significant investment. A 10,000 ton plant is great, uh, it's, it's big, um, and if we can fill it, it's big, but we need 100 of those plants globally in order to cut, I think, 25% of all the fish meal 
that is being caught, or all the fish that is being caught for the production of fish meal. So, you know, a 10,000 ton plant, yeah, great, congratulations, well done, but we need much bigger, much bigger scale. And for that, the industry is gonna have to drive its cost down. So the gentleman from EMR said, you know, insect meal has a very bright future if it's done right. I'm sure that he infers that if it's done right includes manage your cost to a cost competitive point. And I'm very keen to hear all the other attributes that he's looking for. All right, well, let's, let, let's move on and ask Tom and then Max, go ahead. Um, Why do you feel yeah, that no, way? I mean, sure, um, aligning on kind of all of the challenges uh, that you and kind of Carson spoke about when it comes to scaling the, these old protein companies, we've seen um, all of that, I guess, within uh, our own portfolio. So we've invested heavily in this category. We've invested in three companies, uh, NFR Bio out of Finland, Callista out of the US, and Protex out of the Netherlands, which is another, another insect company. I'm, I'm glad to say that uh, both Protex and Callista have gone through that kind of initial phase of really setting up their first com uh, commercial plants. Um, NFR Bio um, is just about at that stage, but I think there'll be some good news uh, coming up shortly. Uh, but in general, when, when, when speaking about feed, I think there is a topic that we within the investment community are really not speaking um, enough about, and that's the topic of genetics. So if you look at the global aquaculture industry, it's mind blowing to realize that only 10 to 15% of the animals that we farm come from selectively bred and domesticated uh, parent animals or broodstock. That's a huge missed opportunity from an impact perspective and from a saving feed perspective. Um, and investors really aren't paying a lot of attention. And I know there are a few good reasons for that, but the reality is if we get the genetics right of that, say 85 to 90% of the fish that we farm, we could, we could uh, save on huge amounts of feed. So we've been, doing a bit of digging here and we've been doing some back of the envelope calculations and we've looked at uh, a few species, um, carp, um, gourami and catfish in only Indonesia, Bangladesh and India and we've looked at selectively breeding. So just, just selective breeding, not applying any kind of modern genetic tools for two to three generations and we could reduce the FCR by 10 to 15% which in 10 years with a 25% market penetration of these better genetics would lead to 800,000 tons of feed saved. Now that's a huge amount of feed. And if I'm then looking at the billions that are invested in the alt protein category, totally um, justified in my opinion, but I do uh, feel like it's a little bit, and this is a Dutch saying, Marcel, you'd recognize it, mopping with the, uh, mop, we're mopping the floor with the tab open here. We also have to really solve for the uh, genetics issue. I think that really makes me think of what happened with broilers over the mid 20th century. You know, I think between the time when the broiler actually chicken broiler started showing up in the 20s to now, I think I think the cost of per pound uh, inflation corrected is half of what it used to be. Can I give you the numbers? Yeah, please. So 50 years ago, it took 113 days to raise a chicken. Uh, now, nowadays, that's down to 46. Uh, feed conversion ratio is four to one. Nowadays, it's about two. That's what the broiler industry has done in 50 years time. The insect meal industry, and I'm talking to insect meal and, and Tom is talking broader, um, but the insect meal industry needs to do that in three rather than 50. Uh, but if you, can get, mm -hmm. if you can get that kind of impact in the insect meal industry, the economics will start to work. And that's how we are gonna convince the Cargills of the world where I used to work that, hey, not only is this much better for the environment, and for biodiversity and, and, and. But it's actually a very competitive ingredient relative to fish meal. What's really exciting is doing this with the insect meal and also the fish. And then you're talking about a nine times improvement yep. on the supply chain to, to, to fish meal, to protein. Yeah, I just want to add, there's also a fundamental benefit or a fundamental advantage fish have over other livestock, which is uh, twofold actually. One is that they are buoyant in the water column, so they don't use enough a lot of energy just standing upright, like chicken do. And the other one is that they're poikilothermic, so they're not adjusting their body temperature to a fixed uh, temperature like, like humans or, or livestock does. So, and that, that just generally gives them the, the, the potential to be very, very efficient in, in feed conversion to, to protein. Everybody can take that home. Fish are almost asleep. They're chilling. <laughs> That's great. All right, oh, Max, we have one more, one more insight. Yeah, appreciate appreciate that. So, so um, 
So, you know, you, you asked what's interesting to us. I think it's important to look at the, the lens with which we look at the industry. And Ocean 14 Capital is you know, EU-based Article 9 uh, impact fund. And we always like to say that we, we operate and, and view things at this intersection of sustainability and finance, as many others do here as well. Because we fundamentally believe that the drivers for one are the same as the drivers for other, mainly predictability and control, but underpinned by good data. And I think all over this industry, there's a tremendous lack of quality data. And there's some great companies that we're looking at and invested in to help capture data to enable uh, farmers, uh, uh, managers, uh, investors make better uh, decisions with, with what they have. We also have invested in the um, uh, in, in this alternative protein space, similar to Aquaspark with Callista and Enthos, Black Soldier Flies in Colombia. And Marcel, I think you're absolutely right. Um, you know, moving towards that, that tropical model now, after following this first phase of the industry where there was really a tremendous amount of capital destruction, which can naturally happens in these phases, now we're moving on to this, this second phase now where there's a better marrying of the biology uh, and the mechanical production you know, uh, in climates that I think make more sense with lower CapEx production, you know, and, and, and using automation when you need it, but not all the time, um, which, which I think is critical, you know, really looking at that very hard. And then when you're scaling up, like you mentioned, from 1,000 to 10,000 tons, no one argues the need for scale. It's making sure you're paying, you know, incredible attention to the risk of execution to get to that scale, because often what we find and you see this a lot in, in, in RAS particularly, is that in, in these single point massive salmon facilities, for example, that any scale you hope to gain is often lost by problems with an underappreciation for risk of execution to get there. I don't think that's different um, in, in this industry, whether it's single cell protein or, um, or, or, or insects, that a laser sharp focus on that risk is absolutely critical to make sure you get from uh, A to B and you're able to take advantage of that scale. Actually, I was really intrigued by the, the what you said about sometimes automation is not what you want to do. Does anybody have any examples of that? I mean, here in Silicon Valley, automation is something you want to slap on almost anything. Um, yeah, and it's relative to, to, to labor costs. Uh, there's a, a number of dynamics that will help you get to a decision on automation. Um, I think sometimes there are blinders I, I've seen on some groups that are just so focused on automating, but they're not really looking at uh, why they're automating and, uh, and you know, really for what reasons, you know, where there's extremely low labor uh, costs in some areas in certain parts of your process. It just might not make sense to do that. Yeah. Well, yeah, in Vietnam, labor costs on a per hour basis is like 10% of what it is in Europe. Um, the, the industry, the insect meal industry is very capital intensive. So uh, Entobel has built a 10,000 ton plant for an investment of 25 to $30 million. Uh, that business is going to generate about 25 to $30 million of revenue. Hopefully we're going to get some premiums at some point in time. That means that it's a capital to revenue ratio of one. That's a heck of a lot more capital intensive than... What's the payback period on, on that one? Well, that depends on what EBITDA margin that we can get to. And, and you know, so at Entobel, we think that if we can achieve parity or just maybe a slight premium relative to fish meal, we can generate enough EBITDA margin to bring more uh, investment into the sector. Uh, the... This is not, you know, I, I've also invested in things where, you know, software things where you think, oh, man, if that hits, you know, we, we can serve a billion customers with 15 people. That's not what the insect meal industry is. It's labor intensive. It's, car, it's, it's capital intensive. Capital intensity ratio of one. The European players have capital intensity ratios of two or three. Um, so then you need like 50% EBITDA margin in order to make the whole model work. And in terms of labor intensity, 10,000 tons in Antobel, I think we are deploying, deploying something like 200 people. Mm -hmm. um, if you do the math, that is in Europe prohibitively expensive. So you, that's why you see these companies go deep down the path of trying to engineer the labor out of the plants. I see. And, and in Vietnam, to spend $150,000 to replace one headcount. 
that's doing something maybe once a day. It just doesn't make any yeah. sense. Yeah. So, so yeah, the Entovel plant is pretty automated and robots and all the whole, the, the mm -hmm. you know, the whole nine yards. But still, yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm a bookkeeper. Sorry. <laughs> I've been a bookkeeper all my life. So, you know, yeah, you got to think about the economics. How can we make the economics work? Because if we don't make the economics work, the investment is not going to come and we're not going to hit scale. So we can lean on the Cargills of the world that, hey, you you got to help this industry to come along and buy some volume so that we can all climb the learning curve, just like the broiler industry has done. But the industry is under an obligation to make sure that the economics work. Because if we don't get the economics to work, then we're not going to get the investment. And, and it's, not, and and it's one, going to die anyway. Even yeah, and does. one other piece to that is, you know, when you're operating in an environment of high fixed costs and arguably high, high OPEX and a commoditized product on the back end, there's not many levers you can pull when that price drops, right? You're stuck in that environment. You see that in RAS amplified quite a bit. I think you can see that here as well. So making sure you have control on that front end of those costs can really make the difference for the marginal producers when, you know, where they will get knocked out typically or taken over when that price drops and you don't have any levers that you can pull at, at, at that point in time. It's something to, you know, you need to find a way to smooth out um, uh, the, those cost fluctuations when you're dealing with commodities. This is great. Okay. I, I just want what's what's the the if you could build a greenfield factory, what would be no strings attached? What would be the the ideal economies of scale? The ideal nameplate capacity? Is it twenty thousand uh, tons? Fifty? No. 000? From what I understand is is from the management and and um, the economics of scale start to taper off at fifteen to twenty thousand tons. Uh, so 10,000 ton is a good capacity. We think we can make the economics work for a smaller plant. Um, the big next bottleneck is going to be feedstock. Um, um, I was just talking to somebody in the audience who knows how to mobilize food waste, uh, and that's really hard for all sorts of reasons. So uh, feedstock is, for the moment, for Entobel, mainly um, coming from Heineken, spent grain, and they have struck a strategic alliance with Entobel. So good news, they have figured out, hey, we need a different outlet for our spent grain because feeding it to animals isn't you know, looking great in our, um, uh, in our scope three reports. So they have decided that it's a really helpful to divert some of those streams to, um, uh, to insect meal. And they've just done a whole analysis, so that's great. Um, but there isn't enough spent grain in the world, and there aren't enough companies that are actually focused on that in order to fill. You know, if we want to get to 100 plants, we need different feedstock. And that's why people are talking about we got to get to Indonesia and use the, um, the byproducts from the palm industry because the palm industry has, uh, you know, byproducts and, and volume that is almost unlimited. Maybe I'll just add one thing there, um, uh, because I do believe that in a way, you know, this, this conversation makes it sound like a lot of this is really an engineering exercise and where I think a lot of the companies in the market have gone wrong is really in managing people and attracting the right talent to make it happen. In the end of the day, we're still in the investing in people business uh, and we've seen companies having huge challenges attracting the right people to execute on the one hand and two, having the right people to manage a whole variety of stakeholders involved to get through that kind of scale up phase, which ranges from really kind of feedstock suppliers, your investors, regulators, buyers, um, et cetera. And that's been a, yeah, a big challenge that we've seen as well. So in the end of the day, people do really matter. It's an open door, but it, it's a big learning for us. Um, I, 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 sorry, go ahead, Matt. No, go ahead. Well, I just wanna, I just wanna sort of underline that because what I see is you have entrepreneurs coming up and every time they're getting another round after the A, they have to learn a completely different set of people, right? right? right. People that they did not know existed, yeah. right? And so it's, you're talking about a complete lack of experience or even awareness that people at scale are completely different than the people that deal with now. And I guess to Carson's earlier point as well, there's been a lot of over-promising in the sector, right? So early investors, 
have been overpromised uh, kind of kind of timelines, unit economics, and all that. That's mismanagement of stakeholders. Many of these CEOs actually knew that would never happen, and that is backfiring to them right now because you know some of these stakeholders are kind of walking away, and it becomes incredibly difficult for them to go through that scale-up phase because these stakeholders are walking away. Yeah, there's not been a single portfolio company in our 50-plus portfolio that that is in out of the 50 there's maybe 15 or so that are scaling up a, a commercial pilot and not one of them has managed to stay in their time or cost uh, you know projections and it, it it's honestly it's annoying <laughs> it is. so I, I I think that these are really important points and we're guilty I think of this in this industry of often being in our own echo chamber and there's such a great, sexy story to tell about the promise of all these sectors of aquaculture, whether it's feed or grass or farming, whatever it is, and saving the world and feeding the growing planet and things you hear at every single one of these conferences you go to. And then you combine that uh, with, with investors that buy into that, and often that capital is put into projects that weren't properly de-risked or otherwise. What we find often in this industry, especially as you go down the scale of earlier stages, you find people that are really, really best in class, good at at uh, one or two things, and they're they're the best at it. But there's often blinders uh, up and down the supply and value chain of really what it takes to get that great idea or skill or animal that they can grow or whatever it is they're converting to market and to go from the group of scientists or otherwise to industrial scale. Uh, and that's hmm. that's the challenge. And I think, you know, yeah, I, I, I just want to say, just say it saw Bob sitting over there. That's one exception. The Montana microbial team did manage to uh, but not not within the time frame that we had hoped, but almost just a little bit delayed. And in and I just want to use that opportunity to say that we are talking about insects, we're talking about single cell protein. We haven't talked about new plant-based derived ingredients to replace fish meal, fish oil, um, especially on the fish oil side. I think there's some ex uh, exciting activities on the genetically modified. Um, uh, crops um, that that are that are being done at the moment, and then on the so for example, the barley protein concentrate really truly is a fish meal replacement. It has almost no uh, anti uh, anti nutritional factors, um, and and there's some other on the on the canola protein developments that I think are also exciting. So something I think we also should discuss in this forum at some point. Uh, yeah, I want to push this back to you, Jitender, because. Your your fund and your people are the ones who actually only do scale. And I think partners like you really understand this, but how can you be more accessible or what do you need to hear before your, some of your experience come into the startups? So good point. First, I'm going to challenge the um, aquaculture industry. This is a secret between all of us. You have to take more calculated risks. I know you are commodity companies, the profit margin is this much, but I have seen very little risk appetite from aquaculture industry to some things like single cell protein to come. Single cell proteins were there 50 years ago. They picked the wrong organism, yeasts, uh, but it's been there for a while. It's the risk appetite of companies has to increase a bit and in a methodical way, don't replace everything with single cell protein. Start with 2%, 5%, and then inc increasingly go ahead. One other thing, I'm a Indian by birth, citizenry is American and Aussie by choice right now, but this country has tremendous potential. You guys need to talk to your lawmakers in making national facilities for scaling up things. Not everybody, and I keep picking on Jennifer, sorry my friend, not everybody is Lanza Tech. Not everybody has got 17 years. The people who are making microbial oils and everything, they need scale-up facilities to understand this. And these need to be like a national lab, like the Pacific Northwest or whatever. Where you prune it in the lab, you go there, you start with five liters, you can go to 500 and 1,000, and then that's where get you confidence as investors for the next scale. That I see as a glaring gap in this industry. And uh, I think you have to talk to, you pay taxes, all of you. You have to talk to your lawmakers saying that 
We did this with, there would not have been a commercial airline if it was not for US Postal Service being mandated to send its mail by air mail. <laughs> so I, I, think, I think we need to do that. Uh, I am inherently for taking one carbon compounds, which are pollutants, and converting them into something. Alternate plants and everything, there's not enough land left. That's interesting because there really isn't money to sort of like create that sort of experience for companies to sort of come in. And the government is a good uh, is a good potential way to fund it. But so good example States of that difficult, right? Good example for biomanufacturing for that in the U.S. is the uh, institute called Biomade. They have grown like this. Industries have come in, pulled in. No one person can do it. So you need to we need to have a concerted effort. I know you and I are both from the government in the past, but well, you know, it, it goes into what's the what's the role of of capital from the government. I don't think it's to displace private capital. I think it's to go where the private capital yeah. won't go to to boost it up. And I think that's early stage, and it's hard to it, it's hard to do. Um, but what's one thing that's unique in the U.S. Um, that I think is a part of that is the three legs of the stool of working together of of government. Um, industry and the university sector through research and um, extension and outreach. And that's really a unique animal. And that, that's a big, uh, big part of that. I mean, the dynamic here in the U.S. is we export our beans and our research overseas and it comes back as fish. And, you know, they're trying to sort of reverse that trend here. But that's what it is. We outsource that for, for a lower price of production. Right. So, yeah, please. There's one more. Yeah, no. So I would um, argue that the aquaculture industry has a better job to do in terms of explaining uh, the promise that it holds. The world needs 75% more protein by 2050. Um, that's pretty much a given. Hopefully that's not all gonna be beef. Uh, here the guy who used to work for one of the largest beef companies in the world. Um, uh, hopefully that's gonna be fished. It can't be dragged out of the ocean. It's gonna be, have to be farmed. And the amount of money that is flowing into the aquaculture business and therefore the amount of innovation that is being funded, in my observation is, and also the valuations, you know, are low. So the amount of money isn't all that big and the valuations are low. And I find it surprising. And I think that has something to do with the fact that the industry has a you know, has an opportunity to tell, to tell a better story. One of the reasons why I'm talking to Hatch is because I think they are fundamentally investing at valuations that are really low. I've also invested in a cultivated, cultured meat company. Um, the valuations there are sky high. If I look at some of the things that Hatch is working on, as an investor, you sort of sit there and say, whoa, that's attractive. Yeah, but we also more realistic, and I think that's another learning that the investor community has been having, is that not every aquaculture company has a billion dollar market. I, 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 like we are for, first and foremost investing in aquaculture technologies, not just the farming part. And the feed, the feed businesses, ingredients, yes, sure, that's billion dollar markets. But if you have you know, components like a genetics uh, innovation or whatever it is, you, you are quickly looking at you know, enterprise values of 50 to 100 million that yeah. you need to make work with a VC return. The, so the, initial sorry, valuations the, the, are low. The bigger, the bigger point is that I think valuations are still relatively low relative to other sustainability initiatives that I see where people are willing to pay enormous amounts of money for a promise that is 10 years out in the future. And what Tom just said is, well, we gotta go and scratch <laughs> the surface on selective breeding. Um, and let's invest money in that, and that probably generates, you know, decent returns. So I think the sector is still underinvested. I th I thought this morning's presentations were great. You know, there's all these arguments as to, well, let's go and I do this. Maybe just sorry to add one comment there. I, yes, the category is is underinvested. I think one of the reasons that is the case is also where I think the aquaculture industry needs to get better at kind of communicating kind of some of the positive attributes of the industry, but also at actually communicating about the problems, right? If you're an investor, if you're an innovator and you're getting started in this industry, it's really hard to get an actual grip on the actual problems in the market because it's not talked about enough. I, I just want to throw in there that the reason that cultured meat is such a popular investment with such high 
with such high valuations is because it has this amazing charisma because people relate to meat in a way they don't relate to, to fish or gasoline or other things that we've tried to do sustainability. And so that's a very strange sort of emotional problem to me. Um, I think I'm going to try to move to the next question, although I just love this conversation, but just to just to sort of throw some um, fresh fuel on the fire here. So uh, the next question we had was sort of about pricing issues. And what what we see is that the, the fishing industry is going further and further out. It's going deeper and deeper. It's going through more and more work to get sort of bring the protein in. Um, is that going to affect aquaculture in the next five, six years as their costs go up, as fuel prices might fluctuate? Does, this, does the fluctuation of these costs benefit the investments here? And anybody? Well, well, finally, I guess, in that sense, looking at it from a more positive angle, there is a wedge for innovation and uptake of innovation, right? So as, as costs are on the rise, we see an increased appetite for you know, some of the feed players or some of the farms to actually seriously start considering some of the old proteins, which kind of become price competitive right now, as an example. Yeah. And, and any other comments on that? I mean, I think. Well, I, I mean, I, I just, I just feel like, okay. So I, I feel f uh, that it's fundamentally going to be. T so we used to talk about the singularity of aquaculture versus wild caught fisheries. We would always say we got to get aquaculture products to a point, to a price point, where wild fisheries don't make any sense anymore because you, you, it's just not as, uh, as cheap. Um, so it's more cost effective to farm a fish than to catch it. But the truth is, it's just very, very difficult, right? Because you essentially the farming is done in the ocean um, for free and you just got to go out and catch it. So I, I, I think that's the, the, there's still a long way to go to kind of to kind of, you know, be able to compete on that. Yeah, I, I also think it's not there yet, but you'll see more of you know, that, that sort of pricing consciousness of consumers coming into play. And the question now is, you know, the, of the sustainability, the IUU issues around fishing, but is that is that supply chain push or is that consumer pull demanding for it? I, I think they're much, you know, especially in the shrimp world or otherwise, they're much more price conscious than uh, really demanding that transparency and paying for it. Uh, yeah, that, that's also a like, misconception we had 10 years ago, I feel like right. everybody was expecting consumer consciousness to continue to be growing, it's, it's, oh, right? And it just didn't, yeah, it's exactly price consciousness, right. yeah. No, so that pull isn't there yet. Yeah. It's, it's getting there, but more here in California, so I see you. You're looking thoughtful, Marcel. Yeah, so two issues on that. One, externalities that need to be priced in, and they're Correct. not. Big problem. From what I understand, if you make a wooden table, you have to account for the carbon function of the of the wood that goes into the table. And if you drag a ton of fish out of the ocean, you don't, one. And then secondly, uh, from and I, I'm careful to say this with all, because I'm with all these experts in the room, but from what I understand is the oceans are deeply underappreciated source of sustainability, carbon sink function, function in particular. I interacted in, a, in, a, in another event recently where somebody pointed out that the US government spends $50 billion per year on space exploration and $50 million per year on ocean exploration. And that's kind of really weird. And you know, I'm not arguing that the $50 billion for space exploration should be coming down, but as humanity, you know, it strikes me that people make very convincing arguments that one of the shortest routes to um, some of the big problems that we have, such as carbon capture, is the ocean. So as a society, we're massively under-investing in, in knowledge and in publicity and awareness about the functions of the oceans. Actually, I'd, I'd like to ask... ask I just want to... Uh, okay. How would you propose, like can we... And I totally agree with you on that yeah. one. But how can we price in fish meal externalities? How would that work? Is that a, right. uh, a tax... No, I, I would just like it to be uh, a CO2 charge. Um, and because actually companies like Cargill are reacting to it. And why are they reacting to it is because their customers are asking for it. I was just talking to somebody recently who once works for one of the largest food service uh, food companies in the US. And she is entirely dedicated to making sure that the likes of Google 
get full visibility on the carbon footprint of their of their food. Uh, there's they, no doubt that they want that, right? Uh, yeah. But to Max's point, and they're willing to pay for it, a little bit, a little bit, a yeah, tiny okay. bit. Okay. No, Guys, I, I'm getting a time signal that we are almost done. So, and I apologize, we're just going to have to hit your questions to the panel uh, during the break. Uh, but I want to leave this with Max because the question is: is can we tax our enemy? And our enemy is the the ocean is free, right? So, how do you feel about that? Having spent so much time with the government. So, look, I've I've been inside how the sausage is made here in the U.S., and you know, I also got out of the predictions game in 2016. But, um, you know, that that's 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 a real tough one, especially for the U.S., where we're importing, you know, roughly 88, 91 percent of our seafood um, every year, and that dynamic of what we export and what we bring back in is a is a difficult one. But I, I do think that um, tax policy has a role in driving consumer behavior um, towards a North Star that you might all be, be working for, and that might be sustainability-based um, or, or otherwise. But it, it's a tough one. <clears throat> it's particularly tough in the seafood industry because there's oftentimes a, a, a tendency to link it to other proteins like beef, like chicken, like pork. The difference is when there's a problem or something in beef, the entire industry coalesces around that to solve it, to bring capital to it, to bring research to it. Same in chicken, same in pork. Aquaculture is more like agriculture. Tons of different production methods, tons of different stresses and diseases, tons of different challenges environmentally or otherwise. It's not like a single protein. When you think of you know, tax policy on top of that, well, who, which production method are you affecting, which producer, which grower, which smallholder farmer in another country is really going to suffer because of that? And when you start to peel back the layers of the onion, it becomes very complicated very quickly. And the behaviors you're in good faith trying to change mold or, or turn a little bit often have effects on those that shouldn't be paying the price. And it's typically the smallholder farmer in, in distant lands. Very interesting. Well, I want to thank the panel for an engaging conversation and hope that you'll continue that during the rest of the conference. Thanks. Thanks, John.